But you know, even though Belgians have left, I want to take you today to on a trip to Canada. Would you like that, to go to Canada? Sure. We can do it by the magic of video. I've just come back from Canada. Uh, many of you know I was there for my mother's funeral. As a matter of fact, three weeks ago exactly, I was preaching in my hometown Anglican church, the church that I caused so much distress to and my family 50 years ago. This young boy who sang in the choir, and he's become Armstrong. I, what has happened? How did we go wrong? But they've been nice. They've let me uh, speak to them for five times, and that was great. Going to carry on with that today because some of you are still extending condolences, which we appreciate. But, you know, talking about birthdays, anniversaries, Canada, the nation of Canada, very important, the United States' best customer by far. More money goes back and forth between one province, Ontario, than all of Japan and Europe. Incredible, but being Canadian, we don't say anything about it. So <laughs> it just goes on notice. But here is something you might enjoy, and it leads into what we'll be talking about later. Uh, Tom Brokaw, during the 2010 Olympics, uh, thought it was time to introduce Canadians to Americans. and did a very nice job. So we're going to do that with you here, which will help set the stage, I think, for what's going to follow. So if uh, Steve is ready, we'll take you to Tom Brokaw. This is the Peace Arch, standing near the westernmost edge of the U.S.-Canadian border, 30 miles south of the Olympic City, between Blaine and Washington State, and Surrey, British Columbia. This was dedicated in 1921 to commemorate the treaty that ended the War of 1812 between the U.S. and Great Britain. Remember, Canada was a British colony. That was a long time ago, but the inscription on the arch sums up the relationship. May these gates never be closed. We share more than a long border, of course. No data line can divide our joint stewardship of a treasure of natural riches. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, and back again. Shorelines, wild rivers, and great lakes, vast forests and grasslands, precious ores buried in majestic mountains, and wildlife everywhere. From sea to shining sea. Canada and the United States share another unique quality. They're immigrant nations, destinations for people around the world who long for political freedoms, economic opportunity, and a long tradition of compassion. Our two nations have the largest trading relationship in the world. One and a half billion dollars transacted every day. The two-way trade at the Ambassador Bridge between Detroit and Windsor alone equals all American exports to Japan. And we're so comfortable as neighbors. 200 million, 200 million people cross the common border every year. Canada, some may be surprised to learn, is America's largest oil supplier, and the United States is Canada's number one tourist destination. In a snapshot, Canada is a huge country, second largest in the world next to Russia, but its population is only about a tenth the size of the United States, 34 million, split into 10 provinces and three territories. 90% of Canadians live within 100 miles of the U.S. border, residing in world-class cities, thriving farms and smaller towns, with good reason. Life in the Canadian North is only for the hardy. It is remote and oh so cold. The coldest day ever recorded in North America occurred in 1947 in Snag, Yukon, minus 81 degrees, not including wind chill. Fun. Canadians are so generous, they share with us their brightest stars in music, comedy, acting, sports, and journalism. And if you're in a fight, you want the Canadians on your side. They were in World War II before we were. They were there on D-Day, in the air and on the beach. They've been America's most reliable partners in Afghanistan, and it's been costly and painful. Now, when Canada loses a warrior in that distant land, the nation pauses and honors the fallen along what is called the Highway of Heroes outside of Toronto. Even 
and their diplomats have been there for us. In 1980, a year before the conclusion of the Iranian hostage crisis, six American embassy personnel would escape from Iran in an operation organized by Canadian Ambassador Ken Taylor. The United States is thanking Canada for rescuing those six American diplomats from Iran. Taylor hid the Americans after the U.S. Embassy was stormed, created fake Canadian passports, then flew the Americans out of Tehran with a bogus cover story. The six in disguise as a mob-looking Hollywood film crew allegedly researching a prospective sci-fi play. Now, all these years later, Taylor has admitted he was formally working for the CIA, and if the Iranians had discovered he was an American spy, he would have been in big, big trouble. In our darkest hours, Canada has been with us. On September 11th, as the United States shut down its airspace, Canada instituted Operation Yellow Ribbon, landing 239 U.S.-bound flights with 33,000 passengers at 17 different Canadian airports. And then, amid the uncertainty that followed, entire communities housed and fed those thousands of passengers for days afterward. history of sovereign neighbors, there never has been a relationship as close, productive, and peaceful as the U.S. and Canada. We share a continent and so much more. Speaking before the Canadian Parliament, President Kennedy summarized the relationship this way. Geography has made us neighbors. History has made us friends. Economics has made us partners. And necessity has made us allies. Of course, there are some distinct differences in the culture. The American fans of these games will be unfurling the stars and stripes at every opportunity and chanting USA, USA. The Canadian Prime Minister had to go before Parliament yesterday and urge Canadians to engage in what he called an uncharacteristic outburst of patriotism, saying, don't be afraid to wave those flags. We'll apologize to the world for our immodesty later. So that's a big difference. He hopes he has to do it very often. You know what struck me in that piece among, among all of the items? There are more people in California than there are in all of Canada. Well, and Canada has a stronger and more sound economy at this point as well. That's what you're saying. Thank you, Tom. Not, <laughs> not quite true now, by the way, since, uh, since the Trump bump, the Canadian dollar has gone way down. My wife turned in 40 Yankee dollars and got $49 back Canadian. So, you know, it's just always changing back and forth. But it is a special relationship. I forgot to mention it's July 1st is Canada's 150th birthday, July 1st. It's so close to the 4th of July, like just about everything else. Now, if you go across Canada, you leave here, and you go where you watch your weather reports always seem to end in Maine. And if you go past New York, Boston, and Maine, and you keep going past Nova Scotia, past Prince Edward Island, you will get to my hometown, which is in the province of Newfoundland. I think we have a slide to show my hometown. I was walking there one day. This is the little harbor. You don't, didn't get it? No, sorry. Oh, now you tell me. Okay. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to be close. I didn't get the one about my mother and father? No? Okay. You're forgiven. <laughs> it will save me some time. I had a picture of mom and me and dad which Pastor Bernie graciously passed out while that we were up in Canada. And it's the picture everybody likes about her, except I look like a bit of a geek. And, uh, my father looks like the wild man from Borneo with his hair. But where did he get all that hair? What happened to me? You know, so. Anyway, here we are, and we're going to talk about what happened to Mom? Where is she now? The story that we took back and that we tried to explain three weeks ago. The Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And we used to have a tradition, we had a custom, we may try to bring it back here, is that when someone died, we opened up the pulpit to those that next week to come up and comment on, you know, their lives and what these persons' lives have meant to them. 
Well, it was about only four weeks ago Daniel Zamorano died. And I don't know if any people knew a lot about Daniel uh, coming into the, a new church situation. But about, do we have that one, uh, Steve? That clip? Okay. Uh, about 15 years ago, Curtis May and I put together a video on reconciliation and forgiveness. And we were looking for examples, real life examples of forgiveness. And not many people probably knew this because I can't say Daniel was quiet and kept to himself. But he didn't talk a lot about himself in that sense. But about 15, 16 years ago, and the crows and all that will remember, uh, his, his son was killed by a gang member. I think it was in San Bernardino, wasn't it? Son was killed by a gang member. And how Daniel handled that, uh, we thought this would be a great story for the reconciliation video. So if that one is ready to go, I'll let Daniel explain to himself. There was a big court case that was dragging both families through the novel, and we'll see how he reacted to that. As Christians, we do have an obedience. We have a responsibility to follow the lead of God in this great movement toward reconciliation. And one person can do a lot. I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine named Daniel Zamorano. In 1998, Daniel, the head of an Hispanic family, found himself affected by the gang wars that bedevil our big cities. In November of that year, a gang member shot his son. Listen to his powerful testimony. This young man pulled the gun from his waist, pointed point blank at my son's stomach, and shoots him. As he's going down, he shoots him one more time in the head. And my son died. During the long, drawn-out court scene that followed, Daniel Zamorano demonstrated that Jesus Christ living inside of him had taught him <coughs> the real meaning of forgiveness. What Daniel told that court should make us all stop and think. I said, guys, I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the Worldwide Church of God. And I say, what I have to say, I don't know what his family is going through, but I know what this family has already gone through. And what I want to tell this man is that I forgive him. And I'm not speaking with my mouth. It comes from my heart, but I'm telling this man and my whole family forgives him too. And they looked at us, you know, you know, People, even, there was two detectives, a young lady and a man. There were tears on their eyes, I'm going to tell you. But what I have to say, that without God, Christ sacrificing that cross, what he, that example, that great example that he set for me to forgive, is very hard, but I knew I had to do it. And I did, you know, and I spoke from the heart, not from my mouth. And coming to know Christ and the cross and what he did for us. What else can I say? Yeah, what else can you say? Some people say you should only extend forgiveness to people who have repented. Uh, I asked my mother and my wife about that. She said, I said, what do you think about that argument? I heard that. Said, well, uh, I think, uh, oh, there we are. Yeah, there's the geek shot, I call it. This is way back, uh, this is about as far, next stop, Ireland, okay? But you can tell there's a nice little uh, church scene here, St. James Anglican, where I was preaching three weeks ago. And that's my father, the wild man, ready to jump through the camera, you can tell. And uh, Janet Chase said that. She said, oh, I can tell who the stable member of the family was. It was my mother, my mother, France. France! That was my dad's last words calling out. France, you know. This was at my niece's wedding. Uh, and so you can see it's a quiet, little Canadian, uh, peaceful setting. And uh, mom looks so nice there. That's my favorite recent picture of her. Uh, she looks like a real sweetheart there. And all mothers are sweethearts, aren't they? You know, that's just such a great shot. Anyway, that's where we come from. But where, where is mom now? Where is Daniel now? You know, when my father-in-law died, Back in 2005, I went for a walk with my brother-in-law to try to cheer him up a little bit. So he said, Neil, I've only got one question. You're a minister. Where is dad now? It's a good question, isn't it? As a matter of fact, you might say, are there any other questions 
more important than that. Those are the things that really matter. Now, I've been involved in 35 funerals just in the last 20 years. I'm not saying that the brag is I didn't do all of them, and it wasn't all our members, thank God. Otherwise, you'd flee if you saw me come in. You know? It wasn't all our members, thankfully, but I've been involved in them. And you really learn a lot at funerals. Funerals are sad. We don't like the separation. We don't like the things that go on at death. And yet, they can be powerful reaffirmations of what we believe. Now, when I spoke to my beloved Anglican church there, the pastor asked me to cover in my father's house our many mansions. Can you give a, a 10 minute reflection on that? Giving one of our guys 10 minutes, that's quite a chore, isn't it? <laughs> but as I began to speak, and I know I had all of my family there in the left, there's about 250 people there, everything from Catholics to Pentecostals. So what do you say? What do you do? Well, as I told him, you know, the great Christian writer, C.S. Lewis, he began life as an atheist back in the 20th century, began teaching English literature. What surprised him when he taught English was how all the Christian authors he had to teach and study, whether it was the Anglican George Herbert or the Catholics or, you know, the nonconformists, the Methodists, we call them, what surprised him was how all the Christian authors were basically all saying the same thing when you got right down to it. Whether Anglican, Catholic, or Puritan, as C.S. Lewis said, they all had the same smell about them. The same smell about them, which got a laugh in the church, which was nice to say. Like the Apostles' Creed, which the pastor had printed in the bulletin, which is the best short summary of what all Christians have in common. And so today, today I said we have to ponder that because because Jesus Christ lives inside of us, can death really be the end? Can death really be the end? You know it's not, and I suspect most of you believe what I'm already going to explain here and talk about, but I just want to fill in some of the dots to connect the dots here today. We have to ponder the fact that Christ inside of us, and what happened to us at conversion? was that the Holy Spirit joined with our human spirit and a new creation was born. His spirit with our spirit make us the children of God. Now, Mr. Emmett Rushing had, was such a great help uh, when I was a pastor, going through a lot of these funerals <coughs> with me. He stood up in front of the church one day, right here. A lot of great stuff's happened here over the years, you know. He stood up and he said, and he asked the question to begin his sermon, are you in the flesh or in the spirit? And I thought I knew the answer, <laughs> but my mind was scanning and turning and all of that. In the flesh, well, I certainly feel like it today after missing a night's sleep. Yeah, I'm in the flesh. <laughs> but in the spirit, and he said, and he read Romans 8, you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. As Isser said, there's two sides to this. We're in Christ, and He is in us. But through the Holy Spirit of God, we already enter into participation in what Paul calls the heavenly places in Ephesians chapter 2. But as I went on to say, in fact, uh, men and women, there's every indication in the Bible that the faithful departed are in a privileged position with Christ. Now they're no longer in relationship with Christ in the midst of this turmoil of this world. But the Apostle Paul speaks sparsely about it, but emphatically, I would rather depart and be with Christ. And so Mr. Rushing put together with the help of the Presbyterian uh, commentaries. You go to his house, there's commentaries all over the place. And one Presbyterian pastor put it this way, in this life we are in Christ. We are in Christ already. At the next stage of life, which is the portals of death we pass through, Paul said we will be with Christ. And that's where I had to leave it with our Anglican and Catholic friends. But as we know, Philippians says, when he returns, we shall be like him. 
So you've got a three-stage process. And while I hate to reduce death to a formula, in Christ, with Christ, like Christ, that's pretty well what I've preached for the last 20, 20 years. I had Mr. Dekatch at one of those girls. <laughs> so I said, what do you think of that? He said, it really works for me. It really works for me, because we might all have slightly different views on some of these things to do with the afterlife. Jesus has ascended, and he has taken us with him. Already now, in this life, do we know what's in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 8, which I shall read, if I have it on the screen here. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4. That's a very familiar passage, because it's the grace passage. Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, verse 4, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I see you're all looking. Okay. That's NIV. Because of his great love for us, God who has made us alive with Christ. We're in Christ now. Even when we were dead in transgressions, by grace you've been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That's what Mr. Rushing meant when he said, you are in the spirit. You are already in the spirit. You are already, dare I say it, sitting in the heavenly places with Christ. Now, I don't use that when the policeman stops me on the 605. You know, don't you realize I'm in the spirit, not in the flesh? <laughs> because the worst thing about death is the separation between the body and the spirit or the soul. Spirit and soul sort of become almost interchangeable in the New Testament. Mary says, my soul rejoices and my spirit praises. It's almost the same thing. And as I told the Anglicans and, they, and Catholics, and they could relate to that, I said, unless every Christian thinker from Athanasius to Billy Graham is wrong, uh, we have life that goes on after this physical life. It's life in the spirit, which has already begun. And so therefore, it brings up the fact that we have to discuss in our literature, and we do this on our website, and I'd recommend everybody who wonders about that to look up gci.org. And you will find a great article on the intermediate state. If I had my whiteboard, I'd write it down. New concept. The intermediate state that is between this life in Christ and the life with Christ and waiting to be like Christ at the resurrection. Now, I preached a funeral on the slopes of Forest Lawn, which is now bragging itself as the best cemetery in the United States. They can have that honor as far as I'm concerned. That's a very dubious honor. The best funeral home, or, and they are pretty good. I've been there too many times. I was on the sloping lawn. I was preaching the first Thessalonians. Now, as a church, we've been very strong on the resurrection, and that's been great. That's been one of our great strengths, actually, over the, over the years, because the, the idea was that Christ returns, you're in the grave, nothing happens, you're, you're, it's called soul sleeping. You're, you're just... You know, there's the three versions of the afterlife. Number one is extinction. Well, no Christian believes that. Number two is soul sleep. That is, you're dead. You're in the grave, and that's it. Nothing else is going on. We had to slowly alter our teaching on that over the years. But even Martin Luther was attracted by that at the beginning of the Reformation because he thought, How, why should there be a resurrection if the soul or spirit goes to heaven? It's sort of like a contradiction, you know, between waiting to be resurrected. Where are we really? Well, it's that spiritual separation from the body. That's the thing that Luther began to realize. Well, God can do this. He can do anything. And so we look at scriptures that are scattered throughout the New Testament. Uh, some of them you already know. It says whether we live or whether we die, we are lords. Uh, he is Lord of both the dead and the living. It says, Paul in another place says, I would rather I would rather live, you know, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. How could death be gain? Nobody would in their right mind today would start off a message like that. 
But that's what Paul said. Die is somehow a gain. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's and rather depart from be with the Lord's. And here is something that my mother-in-law and I, when my father-in-law died, she said, what scripture should we put in the paper? And I said, well, I'm thinking of Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. That's become one of my favorite funeral scriptures. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, says the Spirit. Blessed are the dead. Where else in all of creation would you read a book that says the dead are blessed? There's quite a book we got here in the Bible, you know. Quite a powerful book. There's a lot in there. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors, and their works follow them. Their works do follow them. As we find out when a loved one dies, like Daniel's, Daniel's story of the forgiving his son's murderer is as long as tape exists, <laughs> it will be around. It's on my shelf. It's on Curtis's shelf. I can get you a copy if you want. <laughs> Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. To die is gain. What is Paul talking about? He must be talking about what Christians call the intermediate state. That there must be something that takes place after, I mean, after all, the spirit of God is unified with the whole, with our human spirit and anything that's of God die in that sense. You know, I talked about, uh, I remember a Dave, uh, Dave, uh, what's her? Dave, uh, oh, come on, the lady who's not here with us today. Her, Dixon. Her co, co what's that? Dixon. Dixon, Dave Dixon. And a bunch of United Church of God people in the front row uh, showing up because Dave was so well liked. A lot of people from other splinter groups. There's about 200 people with that one. I said, you know, when Lazarus died and Jesus showed up, uh, Martha, of course, gave him the hard time saying, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But even now, I know whatever you ask God, he will give it to you. Jesus said, your brother shall rise again. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And Martha said, good Jewish answer and perfect worldwide Church of God theology <laughs> till 20 years ago. This is what we, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. That's exactly what we used to teach. You go from this life to the resurrection. Otherwise, the soul is sleeping. And Jesus didn't let her off with that. And boy, it was nice to see the reactions on the United Church people's faces. And Jesus didn't stop there, he said. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Do you believe this? And Martha, to her credit, said, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the... So he is the resurrection, and we are in Christ. And as Don Torrance theology teaches, if the head is in heaven, in some mystical sense, we are already in the heavenly places. This is what it's a bit strange, isn't it? Only God could do this. So at the resurrection, what we're talking about is the reunion of the spirit with the body. Now, we are, are glad to be able to figure this out, but actually the Presbyterians have figured it out about 400 years ago. They talked about the union of the spirit and the body at the resurrection. And then, of course, we go on. So what I did was I left the Anglicans. I left my mother up in the heavenly places. But I didn't get into the rest. I only had 10 minutes, and there wasn't enough time to do it. And I might have blown their mind a lot if I had done. But like I said, it was on the slopes of Forest Lawn, preaching the good old worldwide church of God, first level, chapter 4, you know, the trumpet will sound and all of this. And, the, and then it says, those who, what was it? I'll go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <laughs> the scripture that stayed with me, this is when I was still in the half-evolved state. First Thessalonians chapter 4 says, Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. See, the dead are in a privileged position with God. They are closer to Christ than we are. The dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, that's it. There's some and then we who are alive and remain shall be cut up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air. And he will descend, the dead in Christ will rise first. And it says, those who sleep in Jesus, somewhere in here it says, he will bring with them. He will bring with them those who sleep in Jesus. Death is asleep, all right. In the Old Testament, it's David died and slept with his fathers. Solomon died and slept with his fathers. Jehoiakim died and slept with his fathers. New Testament always advances, always advances the story. The dead sleep all right, but they sleep in Jesus. And that, my friends, I think, has got to make a lot of difference to the whole story. Now, here, here's another famous Anglican I could have quoted named N.T. Wright, and he is trying to convince his fellow 70 million Anglicans and Episcopalians that heaven is not the finale. It's not what it's all about. Now imagine I couldn't get into that <laughs> in my own Anglican church. He said heaven is a resting place. It is so described in the Bible as the reckoning. Blessed are the dead. They will rest from their labor. But as N.T. Wright says, resurrection doesn't mean going to heaven when you die. It isn't about life after death. As we saw, it's about life after, life after death. Life after, life after death. After you die, you go to be with Christ. Life after death. But your body remains dead. Describing where and what you are in that interim period is difficult. And for the most part, New Testament writers don't even try. Hallelujah for them. As Christians get carried, oh, Dale Earnhardt, he's up there now driving the Indianapolis 500s all around the hill. <laughs> or, you know, a Johnny Cash, he's, he's cutting records up there now. Well, wait a minute, you know. Wait a minute. Christians do get carried away sometimes. But the actual solid facts are such that Mr. Bill Edwards, you know, Barbara knew I would get to this. Mr. Bill Edwards, who died several years ago, was a member of this congregation. Uh, he came about two or three weeks before he died, and he sat right in the back. It's a dangerous place, this Glendora Church. Mm -hmm. He sat right in the back, and I said, oh, is that Mr. Edward? Yeah, right. Well, it's so good to see you here. I think he only had a couple of weeks to live after that. But he was out there in the uh, lunch room. Boy, great things happen in church. You know? There's never been two church services alike, ever. Bill's out there in the lunch room, and he's not feeling 100%. And one of the members came up to him and said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry to hear all you're going through. He said, don't. Don't. I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. Christ has already, in some ways, taken me to the heavenly places already. Now, this is sort of mind-blowing stuff. I tell you, only God could do this. <laughs> Luther, Luther himself, the great Luther, by the way, the Reformation is... 500 years old in October, but that's another sermon. Mm -hmm. Luther tended to think at first that maybe that's it. We just die and we wait till the resurrection. But no, but no. Calvin came along and said, when you enter into your rest after, that's the beginning of your reward. It's the beginning of your reward. The fulfillment comes in the resurrection. So we still need the resurrection. That's pretty good. Pretty good. As, as, as Wright was on to say, call it heaven if you like. But don't imagine that it's the end of all things. What is promised after that interim period is a new bodily life within God's new heaven and new earth. God doesn't give up on the body. God never gives up on things he starts and creates. So he's going he's to unite our spirits and our bodies at the resurrection. That's why I'm at the casket. And I almost felt guilty. My sisters are crying. My grandparents are crying. And I'm sitting there, standing there saying, well, this, maybe this is number 35, this is the last, you know, 35th funeral or whatever. But I said, you know, she's in a better place. This is not the end. Now, I didn't dare tell them that because you can come across like some pop and jay, you know. So Christians are their own worst enemies sometimes. Just don't say too much, but I say, you know, I really appreciate having had mom around for 90 years because the custom back home is if you're the firstborn, you get to say the final word over the open casket. You know, there's a lot of Irish people running around, <laughs> running around there to get the old Irish way. So I say, look, the main thing about mom is we had her for 90 years, and we should be very thankful for that. And 
Look at the great family that came out of this. I mean, if we all know this is not the end, and they're all good church folks, they say, yeah, we know that's not the end, but it still hurts so much. And I said, oh, tell me it hurts because it's, it's the most unnatural thing in the world. Death is the most, that's why it's an enemy. It's the most unnatural thing, the separation of the body and the spirit that God put together in creation. It's not meant to be a part. And yet God, who engineered the whole thing in the first place, is going to bring it all about. So if I had my whiteboard today, I would have an arrow going up. I'd have this vague line, squiggly line, called the intermediate state. And where would the other arrow go? Right. We'd go right down. That's right, we'd go right down to the resurrection when Christ returns. In Christ now, with Christ after death, like Christ when he returns. And those who sleep in Jesus he will bring with him. That's what I read at Forest Lawn 20 years ago. Got home and laid back and said, what did I just say? What did I just say? That those who sleep in Jesus, the Lord will bring with him when he returns and unites body and soul, body and spirit together, if you like. Well, got you all confused, I hope not. But you're going to have to stretch a little bit when you start looking at all the passages on this stuff. Where is my mom now? I honestly believe, and you, and you don't have to believe this to be Christian, by the way, any more than you have to believe in the millennium to be a Christian or not believe in it. You know, I believe that she's in the heavenly places, and as I said, she used to play the organ right there. There's an organ my mom used to play right there. She played it for 40 years, and you gave her a plaque, and here's the plaque, and we're not giving it back. <laughs> I got a couple of laughs after this. One guy said it was the most uplifting sermon I'd ever been to. You, you, know, you know you're hitting on good. The cylinders are clicking when the local vicar says, can I have a copy of your notes? <laughs> yes. So it's almost a Russian. In Christ, with Christ, like. It's almost too simple in a way. You hate to make death that kind of a formula, but I now understand what one of my elders said when his wife died 20 years ago in Toronto, I said, how are you doing, Paul? How are you doing? He's standing right in front of his wife's casket. I said, I am so calm, I feel guilty. <laughs> you know, this is exactly what happens. I know where I'm going. Lord Jesus, what did Stephen say when he died? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Jesus said, into your hands I commit my spirit. We used to explain that away, saying it was his breath. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> I used to know all of these things off. And you no, know, breath on the cross, to take a breath to be able to say something, it was excruciating. So when he said, into your hands I commit my spirit, he and Stephen were saying the same thing. And the nice thing about all this, you don't have to believe it all, but it's a lot better than alpha seltzer. <laughs> and it might help you get through some, some dark valleys in life. But let me end off with a more... Uh, with a more sober Christian conclusion. Romans chapter 8, and it'll reiterate the same thing about the intermediate state. And you really should look it up because Mr. Morrison did a very, so fear and so balanced as you go through that. But I've got one as well called Resurrection and Ascension, which sort of takes this side of the argument. But in Romans chapter 8 and verse 20, 31, I had to read this at my dad's funeral. What shall we say to these things then? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, was even at the right hand of God making intercession for us. Now listen, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? If death separates us from Christ, where is the victory? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it written, for your sake we're killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And the great conclusion I am persuaded, persuaded that neither death, 
nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No separation. That's Paul's emphatic teaching. And as J.I. Packer said, it's scattered. The Bible doesn't dwell on it a lot because it doesn't want us to get carried away and, you know, sort of repudiate this physical life. But there it is. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. God be praised that we know people like Daniel, Bill Edwards, and my mom. So, see you all next time.